Dr. Luck. Stand aside, nurse. I'm Dr. Homebrew. What's going on, everybody? It's Dr. Homebrew. We are back for another show full of information. And this one is a real doozy. (laughs) This is one that I've been looking forward to for too long, probably, and to still consider, you know, myself in the, I don't know, the drinking subculture. I don't know what's going on. Um, We are going to be talking non-alcoholic homebrewing. How to do it at home. I love non-alcoholic beers. I would love to be able... Okay. I love the concept of non-alcoholic beers, and I would love to be able to have them at my house, um, you know, without having to mail order them. And uh, on today's show, we're going to get help with that from uh, someone called Jamil Zanishef. Jamil, welcome to Dr. Homebrew, young man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad you were able to uh, to come on the show. So you have a couple of the uh, non-alcoholic beers that we're going to be talking about today, but mm-hmm. you are the sort of guy to guide us through... Um, how to, how to do this at home. Okay. A little bit. Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? Did, I know I didn't ask you before inviting you on, so I guess now's the time just to make sure you know that information. Is that true? <laughs> no, that's, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> okay, great. Perfect. Uh, before we do that, of course, I want to thank our sponsor, five star chemicals. You can go to five star chemicals.com immediately, if not sooner and learn about the best ways to clean and sanitize your home brewing equipment, which is of course, by using PBW and Star Sand and all the other products that uh, Five Star makes. They have um, you know gloves you can buy and aprons and all sorts of safety equipment as well on top of the chemicals that uh, we all know and love. And if your local shop does not carry Five Star chemicals, please demand them to. Pull your pants down and waggle your wiener back and forth. And no, don't do that. Um, but ask very nicely. You know, be like, hey, look, I've heard a lot about Five Star. I haven't tried it yet. You guys don't carry it. I want to support you. Can you please get some in? I'm sure they will do that, and everyone will be happy. Your uh, home brewing equipment will be cleaner and sanitizier, if that's a word, and uh, your beer will be better, too. That's how it works. With me, of course, is Brian and Brian. What's going on, Brian? Hi, and I'm Brian, too. (laughs) We had a lot of uh, meeting up, meeting of the Brians today, or this week, uh, you know, exchanging beers and stuff for, like, later on this show and the next show, and... Alice is like, who's that at the door? I'm like, oh, it's it's my friend Brian giving me beer. And then the other day, who's that? At the, it's Brian. It doesn't look yeah. like Brian. And well, see, Brian's yeah. come in many different shapes and sizes. And some, yeah, are, some are more handsome and uh, uh, intelligent than others. Yeah. And, uh, and some are no, called Brian uh, Cooper. <laughs> about who, who is whom. But you got to come to my house, JP, and encounter like all of our 4,000 animals. That's true. Yeah. I, my, my knees got licked. I felt like I was back in high school. <laughs> that's that's just me. Yeah. yeah well, right. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty nice. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I'm excited, boys. I'm excited to talk uh, non-alcoholic beer. So, Jamil, what's up with non-alcoholic beers? Have you made a non-alcoholic beer yourself? I have, um, and we we did some tests uh, with it at, at Heretic and and tried a few different things. Um, it's it's a the interesting concept. Um, you know, for me, I uh, I like like low alcohol British beers. Yeah, that's why uh, you and I hug and kiss frequently. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, some of the non-alcoholic ones. Once you get to non-alcoholic, it's kind of like. So what exactly is the the purpose of this? Uh, <laughs> yeah. For know, for me, it's the fla- it's flavor. You know, yeah. if I'm trying to back off, you know, as I get older, you know, I'm trying to exercise more and uh, drink less, and uh, that non-alcoholic beer sort of quenches that 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 psychological need for you right. know fizzy right. and malt. Uh, well, and you know, so there's you know a few basic ways of making non-alcoholic beer. Mm-hmm. Um, one is, um, they, they have, uh, you know, you're familiar with reverse osmosis, where right? There's a membrane and you push the water against it and the clean water comes out one side or the pure water comes out one side and uh, the concentrated minerals and everything are just get washed across the other side. Mm-hmm. Well, you can do the same thing with alcohol. So you take beer and you run it across the membrane at under high pressure and it pushes the alcohol through the membrane 
and you get pure alcohol out that side. And then the, uh, the, the other beer, the beer without the alcohol now just gets pushed along the, the process and you, you can separate out hmm. the alcohol from the beer. Here's the dumb, then, here's a dumb question. Is it the same membrane, like reverse osmosis, water, like a water system? No, okay. no, it's a, a, a specialized membrane. Oh, yeah, it'll separate it out. Nice. Um, and so you can you can take um, uh, the the beer that comes out, and you can add water back into it. And there's machines that'll do it all in one continuous stream. Hmm. Um, uh, and you can the uh, you can reconstitute it back to whatever you know water value you want and then you can take the alcohol and you can use that for making a, a seltzer or something like that so that's what one of the popular things are a machine uh that we were looking at at uh, at heretic was something i think around like 90 to 100 grand for a, a fairly basic one well, that's a lot of money. Uh, right. This is um, not something the home is going to have at their disposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know. So, you know Jamil, that's an interesting point because, like, I've known about this process for making uh, seltzers or what they used to call wine coolers or any number of those beverages. And a lot of them were just essentially beer that right. all the flavor got filtered out of. But if you think about that, just the inverse of that, right? You're, mm-hmm. filter- you're de-alcoholizing and you're filtering out the alcohol and keeping mm-hmm. the beer, or as you were just saying, you can use the alcohol for one thing and use the beer, the flavor part for something else, namely like a non-alcoholic beer. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You end up with two product streams that you can use. Um, you need a distiller's license to do that, I wonder. <laughs> uh, it's no. not distilling, so yeah, it no. shouldn't be. You, you can't use the alcohol to um, add to other beers that you make but you can use it to make a seltzer because the seltzer is not TTB regulated, a, uh, or at least uh, you don't have to file a formula or anything like that. It's a, it's a FDA regulation on the seltzer because there's no, really? there's no hops in it. Or you can make Zemo oh. with it. That would be cool. Right. right. Whatever well, flavors in that. So I don't know. making non-alcoholic beer, you can take that alcohol and then make another alcoholic product with the yes. remains. Correct. That's wild can, to me. That, that's less me. regulated yeah. than beer. Yes. Well, I mean, in a sense. Well, yeah, it's different set of regulations. That's true. F, F, I'm not sure if you'd call dealing with the FDA less regulated. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I used to work in medical device land, and yeah, that's not always the easiest thing to deal with. Mm. Right. They'll, yeah. they'll, you know, um, the TTB tends to check everything ahead of time, and then mm-hmm. follow up with you again. Uh, whereas the FDA tends to go like, well, hey, we wrote the regulations. You guys should be following them. And then when they find out you didn't, at some point, somebody complains or somebody dies or something. Then they're like, hey, uh, now you're in trouble. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a slightly different way of uh, working it. It's very hands off. We should just turn this into the regulations show because that's just so fascinating <laughs> to talk about. Like, go deep into the regulations of beer making. Uh, you know all about them inside and out by now, I'm sure, Jamil. You know, um, uh, the second way mm-hmm. that you might do it is uh, to essentially uh, distill it, right? Which uh, you you vaporize the, uh, the alcohol. So uh, under pressure and at a relatively lower at, at a lower temperature than the boiling point of uh, of alcohol. Uh, because or under not under pressure but under vacuum uh, you put it under a vacuum and then you apply a bit of heat and then the alcohol vaporizes you remove the alcohol that way the, the drawback uh, to that one is uh, you're applying heat to the beer and uh, you, you know the more heat you apply the, the more rapidly stale the beer will go over time and uh, you get some heat staling so I have tasted beers from that process and they have um, other equipment that um, is, I think, even vastly more expensive than, than the, the membrane filter, but <laughs> it doesn't uh, require replacement membranes. It, it's, you know, capable of, you know, larger throughputs, things like that. Um, and I've tasted beers from that and they, they tasted pretty good too. Um, 
The third method that uh, is out and about right now is there are companies, um, for example, um, um, uh, Munns is making uh, a non-alcoholic extract. So they make an extract that what? tastes like a finished beer and you, you add that to water and then you can dry hop it. You can, um, one of the things that we did, we, uh, they sent us a, a fair amount of this and we, we messed around with it. Um, you know, you boil, you boil some water with some hops, get yourself some bittering, mm -hmm. you know, you do, do a number of these things. And then, um, uh, one of the tips that they had for that was to add back a little bit of beer, actual fermented beer, uh, to take you up to the 0.5% because, uh, that gives you some of that fermentation character that's otherwise oh, lacking. Interesting. Okay. And I think that that's probably the easiest for homebrewers to do would be something similar to that. Um, the one of the thoughts that we had was, well, you know, how are how are they making this extract? <laughs> uh, you know, obviously they probably have a lot more uh, malt technology and malt extract technology than I'll ever have or understand. Sure. But one of the thoughts I had was, well you know, perhaps you take some, um, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, grains that are more dextrin grains, uh, you know, you take, a, you know, a, a cure of pills or something that, you know, does not ferment that much, uh, give it a high mash temperature, and then, uh, you know, ferment that and see if you can get it to ferment less than, you know, the half percent. And, uh, you know, I, I know homebrewers have, probably tried that before. I don't know. Uh, that's one thing I haven't tried, but mm. uh, I imagine you could, you know, take yourself some, you know, dextrin malts, uh, or maybe even maltodextrin, some, uh, you know, some crystal malts, things like that. Um, and then ferment them and if needed, you know, water it back down a little bit, uh, to get yourself uh, below a half percent trying to make as flavorful a beer as you can with as little fermentables in it basically <laughs> just keep it super low gravity to start and get down right just a little bit so you still have that fermentation yeah that's an inter interesting approach and um uh, one of the things about making home brewed uh non-alcoholic beer is or any anybody making non-alcoholic beer is and the more flavor you have in there the less alcohol you need to make it seem like beer you know, or the more, yeah. the more sins it covers up. So hoppier beers, uh, you know, roastier beers, um, all tend to do well, I think. Yeah. And I've, I've had a, you know, a fair amount, I think of these beers and the, it, it is hard because I've, the first ones I've had were roastier beers. Cause I, I thought the same, I'm like, okay, like a puts Porter is going to be, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it ends up coming out, at least the, the early ones that I had were very work very worthy, mm -hmm. like unfermented right. wort. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a little bit of a, you know, applying the heat, like you said, maybe distilling it and sort of driving it off or, you know, I don't know. I mean, depending on how, how big these machines are. And like you said, they're 90, hundred thousand dollars or more. I can't imagine a, a craft brewery being able to, you know, justify doing that. Um, That's weird. You know, craft brewing and uh, brewing in general is a very capital intensive you know, mm -hmm. business. Yeah. You need to, you know, spend, you know, a lot of money <laughs> in order to have the, you know, have the gear you need to, to, oh, to okay. run. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's something that can be justified. I think the the company that's doing the membranes, they have a program where, you know, set, set up your, they'll, they'll actually, Put the thing in for you. They won't cost you anything. And then when you run it, you have to pay them per batch that you run. And then they're also going to rent it out to other people uh, that wow. can come to your brewery and run it, you know, or wow. you run it for them. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's, that's 
one of the ways to to knock the price down i, I guess i kind of like that i mean for people who have a lot of space you know maybe mm-hmm. at like heretic or uh, you know uh, 21st amendment or whatever because they have more space than the moon that would be kind of interesting that's a that's an interesting right. program that's a pretty smart way to cut the cost for the brewer yeah well you I know like they're it. trying to they're trying to break into those markets and you know you know for brewers you have to essentially show them how it's going to improve their improve their beer which you know, it's non-alcoholic beer so i guess if you're really into non-alcoholics and then yeah you also um you know you need to justify the cost yeah the problem with non-alcoholic beer is uh you know people expect it to be cheaper because it doesn't have alcohol in it <laughs> but that's true i'm You're one of those people yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah 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 and it's not and in fact it's it's the same or maybe sometimes a little bit more because you right. do have well, that extra step right yeah, because you're having to brew beer, and then you're, yeah. you're having to run it through, you know, additional process. Um, I, I guess with you know the the system that splits it into two streams, product streams, um, you get to sell twice as much. You could sell, you know, again a seltzer, and you could sell a non-alcoholic beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's true. I, w- I was just thinking about going to one of these breweries, where, wherever it is. And, uh, and trying it pre, you know, alcohol removal. I think that'd be nice, like side by side comparison. Mm -hmm. How, Uh, how do you, have you heard of any, uh, enzymes or anything like that? I thought there was like some enzymes out there as well for, for people to really be able to sort of enzymatically control fermentation. Do you know about that? Or am I making that up? I might, I might be just totally inventing that. I haven't heard of that. I know there's some some low alcohol yeast strains you can use, and, and right. even even some mm. GMO ones that will just not attenuate certain sugars. You know, uh, they just won't ferment maltose for whatever. You know, they they're just engineered not to do it. But then and it tastes wordy. Then it tastes wordy. Yeah. yeah, it's probably what I've been drinking. But it still ferments. So yeah, um, yeah. How, how do you how do you tackle recipe formulation for something like that? I mean, if you know we're doing it on the homebrew level, like you said, you know we're we're not going to be doing the the machines. We're probably going to be sort of massaging our recipes. But I think we're all used to making beers that have you know that are full flavor. So how, how do you approach? Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is what's missing from a non alcoholic beer that you that you make at at home, and how do you counter that? Does that make sense? You know, what's missing is the alcohol. <laughs> okay, well, listen, smartass. <laughs> I mean, like flavor-wise, right? Like, is there is there a right. component where we have to go? Okay, well, there's not a whole lot of base malt in here, or yeah. hardly any, so we have to add more. D- I, I, I think a big part of it is, um, you know, the fermentation character because fermentation is a huge part of beer, mm-hmm. and um, when you know, through some of these processes, maybe a different yeast or, you know, an enzymatic way of doing it, or, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, non-alcoholic worts or malt extracts, things like that. Um, you know, there's no fermentation or, you know, it's not really, you know, true, correct fermentation. Um, so you end up, uh, missing that kind of that, know ester profile or you know there's there's you know in lagers there's some sulfur and some other compounds and and esters as well so um you know you need to you need to you know find some you know solution for that that's why the the membrane thing works really well Hmm. um the interesting thing for me is you know, a lot of the original, not one of the reasons people don't like non-alcoholic beers, I think is because originally the only thing they wanted to make non-alcoholic was, you know, uh, a, a light Pilsner of some kind or a light, light lager. Yeah. Right. Because, well, that's the biggest market. And so we'll just do that. And so it just didn't taste very good uh, until I, I think Heineken's uh, you know, new product is is actually pretty good heineken double zero we are yeah. big fans on that. i just had one yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so i think uh you know that that really has helped and and there's you know some ipas and stuff on the market that i think also uh taste pretty darn good mm-hmm. uh so 
you know, now that they've, I think there's new technology and there's new, you know, uh, ideas about beer flavors that people want. Um, you know, I think it's, it's come a long ways. Okay. Well, let's crack some of these beers that we have. Um, I did, I did bring you some non-alcoholic beers. The first one I want to talk about is the, uh, the black Butte Porter. We've been teasing this on the show for, I don't know, like a month now. Uh, Black Butte Porter, by the way, from Deschutes, uh, is now in alcohol, non-alcoholic form. So we each have a can of non-alcoholic and a bottle of alcoholic, full, full leaded or whatever. And I'm curious to to, to get your guys' take on it. I've had both of them side by side a couple weeks ago. I don't want to, you know, dilute the judge pool or whatever, uh, whatever people accuse me of doing. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to taint you. Um, but I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. And I, I would also would love to be on like a design feedback panel of like comparing these two in, in development. Right. Cause I would love to just to know how, how they tweak this to get it to taste like the Porter. You know what I mean? It, like, what do they do in the beginning to make it come out tasting the way it does? And I would love to taste that beer too. Basically, I should just own an alcoholic brewery, I think. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting because on the top of the can, it says non-alcoholic malt brew. Are they not calling it beer for a reason? Malt brew? I never noticed that before. And I can't read the, uh, everything is uh, blurry on the can. There are so. some restrictions on what you can say. Oh, Okay. Yeah, that's clearly got to be some kind of, uh, as Jamil was saying earlier, some kind of TTB or FDA uh, regulation for what you can call it. I don't think that all NAs say that. It might just be a it right. might just be a marketing I it's, thing. It's, I think it's just theirs, but it's just theirs. There, yeah. there are things uh, regulations on what you can what you can say. Okay, so what do you guys think about this? Does it taste like Deschutes Black Butte Porter, which admittedly I'm not really the biggest fan of, but. I know everyone loves it, but it just—I can't. It's too fruity. It's it's close, in a sense. I'm not getting the fruitiness, and I'm getting it maybe thinner in body yeah. than I'm used to a Black Butte Porter having. Uh, but you know, it's it's decent. I I don't think it's as close as the Guinness uh, Zero Zero. No, uh, is not. to Guinness. Which damn, I we once you turned me on to that JP a couple of shows ago, <laughs> I I just, I love that stuff. I can't get enough of that. Yeah, it's good but stuff. This man. Is, if that's like close within like ten percent, this is maybe close within maybe twenty five percent. If that makes any sense. Hmm. Yeah, Guinness is pretty thin though to start with, so I think True. that that kind of gives it an advantage. Four uh, percent, yeah, yeah. And the, the way that I describe the Guinness Zero is like it sort of tastes like terribly treated Guinness, like a little heat damage Guinness already, you know, Guinness, Guinness can go from perfect to just terrible in like, you know, five degrees in a day on the shelf. It's just, it's very, for me, it's very volatile the way we get it all the way out here. So, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah. Anyway, that's what so it sort of in the like NA me. version of the black beauty. I'm getting a little more of a kind of a raw malt flavor, like a, you know, like fresh, crushed grains as opposed to like grains that have been through a fermentation process as, you, as much, you know, that, that smell when you walk into the malt room, yeah, that's what, that's the smell that I get out of the can. It is it. Thank you for putting that that way. It is that bright malt, almost malt dusty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's oxidized or anything, but you get almost some of that character too, maybe, but it's, um, um I don't know. I, I think, I think that this is one that's probably run through a membrane. Why do you say I that? Get, I don't get any raw malt. I get. I, I think that. I think that the can is fresher than the bottle. The bottle's a little. <laughs> the bottle's a little stale. Well, you probably. Well, I think that um, maybe what it is is what's missing, though, not the process. Just that mm. the with the alcohol sweetness missing, you get more of that dusty malt character. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that, so that the, I think. I think you're right. The, yeah. the bottle yeah. is packaged on one eighteen twenty two, and then the can says. 010522. I think that's a can on it. So I think that they're basically within the, like what a week or two of each other. Very close. Yeah. I have the same can and bottle here from you. So yeah, it's all yeah. the same. Uh, the, the bottle doesn't taste 
like a fresh black beat to me. Uh, pr- probably not. Admittedly, it's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. Well, and look, you know, I got these from Total Wine. They're not the best taking carers of of beer at all. Um, so it's been it's in my garage. A, yeah. a Black Butte will usually be from draft at a good brew mm-hmm. pub that I know. And yeah, okay, they have that. Yeah, I'll take a pint of that. Um, yeah, it's sort of pokey yeah. and, and not really smooth. But I mean, for me, the main yeah. difference, it, I don't think these taste alike at all. I think it's almost a misnomer that it's a Black Butte non-alcoholic because there is no i mean the mouthfeel is so absent it's so thin and watery it's very well because the alcohol has been replaced with water right and And it's a stronger beer than heineken or guinness to do that too so Mm -hmm. right yeah that's an excellent point jamil and that probably explains why a lot of these uh, na beers end up coming across as watery and a little thin Mm -hmm. even though ethanol I mean, it's not like it's the heaviest Mm. molecule in the world, but it does have certain ways that it coats your tongue or your mouth or gives you a perception that's different and a little more substantial than water, even though the grand scheme of things, you know, if you were to set it down with, you know, measure the weight by volume and everything else is probably not that much different from water, like Mm -hmm. a molecular weight type standpoint is the perception is a lot different. Yeah. The the, size of the molecules are what they're very different. Yeah. You, you, you get it you get it more in your mouth than you do uh with with just water the black butte is only a five and five and a half percent or two so it's not like we're going to making a a belgian quad na or something right. you know but it's a little bit stronger than the others so that's that's maybe a bigger noticeable difference but it could just be a recipe thing too or a process thing it's i don't really know what what they do with it but yeah you, I, you're probably right it might be the membrane thing they can definitely yeah. afford that up there and they make uh, a you know, great product it's, it seems to me um, although I get some staling out of the, the black the non-alcoholic one too <laughs> I was going to say yeah, get it, making an NA beer it seems like you, it would be more prone to oxygen, oxygenation because you're doing more to it in, in general than just a regular beer you're having to go back and, and remove alcohol and, right, right. You know, he, yeah. whether you're heating it or not, it's still going to be more processing and more mm-hmm. handling and more moving the beer. Yeah, um, I wonder if you know how much of that staling is just inherent within the process. Yeah, sure. so I think I do get a little sense yeah. of a little oxidation or something in there that it's not detracting horribly, but mm-hmm. you know, and it's a nice flavor flavorful beer. I really like that it's it's bold and it. it if you tasted this ten years ago when all there was was you know Klaus Holler and and O'Doul's. Yeah. You know, this is like, wow, this is non alcoholic. But now there's so many other choices. I'm, I'm, I'm getting picky about it. It's like, oh, I, yeah, I like that Guinness. <laughs> I like that Heineken. And right. I, yep. you know, I don't mind the Lagunitas and AIPA. That's a good drinkable thing. It's not their IPA or, you know, it's it's IPA like enough that I can enjoy drinking one if I don't want to have right. alcohol that time. Have you had their hop water? Yeah. I, lo- I live off that stuff. I know you like that. Yeah. I love it I so much. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, over ice. Over yeah. ice. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I want I like to try hops, that. So I haven't had that that much. I need to try that one again. It's been a long time. <laughs> I, JP, like I finally had that hoppy refresher you gave me like two months ago. Uh-huh, yeah. That I don't know why I just let it sit in my fridge for a while. That's really damn good. That's what we're talking about. It's great stuff. I've been, I've yeah, been I really was out like doing yard work and stuff in my backyard Love Saturday it. and you know, cutting branches off of trees and shit, being all manly and whatever. <laughs> and I was really tired and hot afterwards. And I had that hoppy refresher and man, that was really good. Dude. I've been really into uh, the day pack series of like hop waters from athletic and, uh, mm-hmm. but they're flavored. Cool. It's like mango mango. Nice. It's like a light man. It's almost like a seltzer, but with hops, I don't know what it is about the earthy. It's like those earthy, it's almost citrusy notes of what some of the hops they use with that mango flavoring and just suck them down all day. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. He can, can I step back to uh, yes. recipe formulation on this just a little bit? Too. I got can. a couple of things I wanted to mention. When you're making a non-alcoholic beer, if you're doing a, a process at home to remove the alcohol, you're going to want to consider how much more flavorful that beer is going to be. If it's you know concentrated, it's going to be more bitter per unit of volume it's going to have more maltiness per unit of volume 
So there might be things you want to back off. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're doing the method where you want to, you know, just do a a very little fermentation, you want to just push up the dextrins and things that the yeast can't ferment. Uh, So things like that you can play with, I, you know, and try to dial that in. Um, One other thing I wanted to mention, and we we did a homebrew presentation. Jamil, you did a great job covering the the ways commercially they do it. Um, We talked about trying to do it on a homebrew scale. And they mentioned all those commercial ways. Uh, but really the easiest way you can do, if you want to make an NA beer at home yeah. is to boil off the alcohol, you know, it boils at 173 point something degrees. Um, you, you can, if you have a precise oven and a good thermometer, you can set it to and a big enough vat to put the beer you want to remove the alcohol from, and you don't care about losing it. Um, you can put it in your oven at 180 degrees until you're, you're satisfied that all the alcohol has been, um, driven off. And I'd be, I'd be, I'd be careful about that. It's pretty abusive to the beer probably, but well, no, I'd, I'd avoid trapping alcohol vapor in an oven. Yeah. Mm. Um, that, that does sound a little dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. I'd do it more like on a stove top or something like that. On a stove. Well, and it's, it's a... the same thing as the commercial yeah. thing. You, you know, if you could apply a little bit of vac into it, you can drop your, your temperature substantially. Yeah. Well, you can get a nice uh, sous vide wand for you know less uh, you know less than fifty bucks probably these days. So, um, you know, keep it at a at, at that temperature for that you know however amount of time you need to get it. Yeah, I was thinking that, but, but you're good just, ventilation. But just do that. It's turning the beer underneath. It, that's how it moves. The, so I wonder if you put it in a bag, and then a big sous vide bag. I mean, you could really get technical with it if you wanted to. Right. Yeah, right. that's interesting. I'll look at some enzyme, see if we can nail that. If, if I was just making it up about enzymes or not, and if they're available on the homebrew on the homebrew scale, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. There's got to be there's got to be some way to sort of enzymatically block fermentation without making it overly sweet. I don't know. Yeah. Right, but then, but then, I mean, then why not just not ferment it? I see. Yeah. Uh, I thought you meant to enzymatically convert the alcohol into something else, something else. but yeah. and it's going to turn into acetaldehyde. It's okay. really nasty. <laughs> yeah, oh, great. Right. Thanks. Yeah. It's um, green apple green skin apple brewer. Beer. They sell uh, on eBay, they sell uh, vacuum chamber uh, vessels along with the pump. I think the vacuum chamber, good size ones, like five gallon or so. Is it a Swedish with, vacuum pump? With a lid and with, with the vacuum pump, the whole thing is like hundred bucks or whatever. We we oh. used it for can testing and stuff. That's not bad. Um, I imagine you could use one of those, put your beer in it, turn on the vacuum pump, and then gently start raising the temperature and draw off the vacuum, and you wouldn't have to get the, the temperature quite so high. Okay. That sounds cool. That might be one way to do it. Yeah, that sounds great put it on a, you know, electric, uh, you know, maybe hot plate or something that you can yeah. control the temperature. Yeah. Oh. That'd be cool. Well, if anyone out there tries it, let me know. And, uh, if it blows up, don't sue us. Um, right. <laughs> one last thing I wanted to, to mention is, uh, the other can I gave you was from athletic. I know I'm like simping for athletic brewing lately, but, uh, it was, it's a dry stout, uh, dry ever stout. I think it's one of the better non-alcoholic beers that I've had. And I wanted to get your guys' take on it, too. I mean, you know, a dry Irish stout is sort of hard to make it's the, well, I think. And then a, and a non-alcoholic version is uh, is probably harder. Um, and uh, I, I like it. It's now like my favorite beer from <laughs> from them. Um, but I want to see what you guys think about it. Give that a good, okay. uh, yeah, I just a good slug. That. Yeah, I'm getting an interesting kind of uh, a little almost cannabis like note in the nose i don't oh, know shit. like mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. a weird skunkiness to it right huh like but yeah, like uh too. resiny yeah that's interesting i gave you i gave you my last is one right on the money cannabis <laughs> yeah. damn now i oh, wish whatever. i had one i, I gotta had a get neighbor again. you know uh yeah uh-huh your neighbor sure yeah and it's like <clears throat> it's like somebody you know lighten up because there's a burnt note to it as well yeah, yeah, it smells like like bong water almost. Yeah. Wow, or an ashtray after a heavy night of. Uh... I haven't taken a sip of it yet, so that like this is probably hopefully one of those cases where the flavor is a little different than the uh, aroma. But yeah, no, thank you, Jamil. Hundred percent, hundred percent spot on. I think. 
<laughs> man it's not a bad aroma i actually kind of in, i enjoy the aroma of cannabis so yeah but a like burnt that. like the sm- the smelling the end of a dube it's like a medi beer mm. it's like uh yeah all right my, my buddy roberto makes some uh medi beers sometimes he sure you does know, roberto. that is for sure roberto you know it's interesting um, it to me it's got a little bit of a uh almost a rubbery aroma like brown malt and brown, brown hmm. malt to me has a very distinctive sort of almost tire rubber type of aroma. Uh, but it, it's not overwhelming. It's just something that's kind of there. Um, it's definitely, you know, it definitely tastes like beer. Yeah. That's what I thought too. It tastes the, it, probably the closest, I don't know the closest, but it's one of those beers where it tastes, it tastes like beer, man. And I think that's if if you can make a non-alcoholic beer and confuse it with beer, I think you're I think that you're perfect. I think that's great. Yeah, I don't know what tricks you would use to substitute for the flavor of alcohol, which you know. I don't know either. <laughs> I got to know. Yeah, they won't they won't talk about it. No. Yeah. They won't I asked them point blank they're like we can't tell you. But it's got a crispness to it. Um it's I would it's consider really... this well attenuated. I wouldn't think of this as watery. This is closer to a beer than that, uh, uh, the Black Butte non-alcoholic that we just had, in, in my opinion. I agree. It's very dry. Well, there's also something to be said for low alcohol beers. Now, I just mixed the Black yep. Butte non-alcoholic half and half with the Black <laughs> I did, Butte. I did too. <laughs> and Wait, it's actually, Cooper, you mixed, you mixed beers? Tell me. I think, it yeah, isn't I, so. I never do this, but it's actually more enjoyable than either one, I think. it's kind of, The blend is better than the sum of its parts. I don't know. Is that, Maybe is I'll run athletic? into my kitchen in a second and do that. Does the athletic just have some hops in it that were the coming across is kind of maybe dank and cannabisy? I think a lot of their a lot of their beers are sort of earthy hops, and I wonder if that is is by choice because it sort of brings the 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 general hoppy beer vibe through to you know what I mean these beers I don't think really are for like hardcore craft beer nerds like us. You know what I mean? Yeah, they do a good job of making a wide variety of beers. They um, do an excellent job. And I, I I, promise one day I'll stop doing free commercials for them. Um, <laughs> if you like a certain but, style of beer that is not produced often and you, you can only get it by going to craft brew, you know, breweries, well, now you can have an NA version of it. Yeah. That's not half bad. Um, Brendan in the chat oh. asks, how does one prevent wart spoilers and other pathogens on a limited fermentation on a very low uh, OG brew? Well, very careful, uh, you know, process control, you know, it's got a cleaning, sanitizing, and you just need to be very, very, uh, very careful. You, you, if your pH is low enough, then you're, that protects you somewhat against pathogens. You can put a lot of hops in it. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. That's going to help a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so <clears throat> since uh, JP generously uh, provide me one of the cans of Guinness. I cracked that open too, since you guys have all had it. Yeah. Very much like grape Kool-Aid. That's a grape Kool-Aid <laughs> character. Oh, shit. Huh. I'm going to go get mine. I have one more can left. I'm going to go get it at the break. A, a grape Kool-Aid. Uh-huh. Okay. I mean, cause as good as the non-alcoholic Guinness tastes, it's not perfect. You can't have one no. <laughs> and confuse it with a normal one, but if you have a normal one, maybe two, and you grab one of these, you'll never know. I think if I was out drinking something else all night and yeah. then somebody poured one of those for me and said, Hey, got you a Guinness. Yeah. I'd probably just drink it and not think anything. You'd right. never notice. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I sort of when think your palate that, is blown. Might as well drink any. Right? Yeah. And I yeah, sort of think that, hammered, you know, this is yeah. why I could see these fitting into my non alcoholic beers fitting into my like sort of drinking rotation. It's like, because it's sort of like a night saver. If you want to have a night, like the other night, uh, it was Greek Easter, by the way, Christos Anesti for my fellow Orthodox. And, uh, you know, I had, uh, we had shots of Uzo. I had like three or four beers with my nephew. They left. I had another beer and I had another beer. And I, that was the mistake. It's that mistake beer. But if I thought about it beforehand, I would have had one of these Johns. And not felt so miserable the next day. Absolutely just fucking destroyed. 
You got to know that that point. Yeah. And I do. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't drink that much anymore. Let's go. And uh, that's wrong. <laughs> we should have stopped. And we, <laughs> we didn't. You're lightweight. You're a cheap date these days, buddy. I am, dude, for sure. I'm, well, I mean, you know, five shots of Uzo doesn't necessarily help matters <laughs> the next morning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, look, man, uh, Jamil, thanks a lot for, for the knowledge. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming in and tasting some of these non-alcoholic beers. You're going to stay with us for the next, uh, for the next segment, right? We actually have a homebrew sure. for God's sakes, and we have an American brown ale to judge, and you're going to, uh, uh, go over your judging notes with the boys. We're going to talk to Jason. Jason is the brewer. And so we're going to get him in here and, uh, come right back. So hang on everybody. Don't go anywhere. It's Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. Now, back to the examination. Hey, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We are joined by Jason. This is uh, about as close to a Council of the Jasons as I think we're going to get. Mm. Uh, normally, <laughs> Council of the Bryans happens when there's three Bryans. Three Bryans. But two Jasons, I think, it equals three Bryans. Right, Jason? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can make, you know what, Jason, I think we should do is make Jamil an honorary Jason for the show. <laughs> He's got the right first letter. He's got so. the right first letter. There's an A in there, too, somewhere. I think it's yeah. good. Uh, All right. Yeah. Welcome, yeah, Jason Zanishev, J- to the show. Yeah. JK, JZ, and JP in the house. That's right. The Council of J. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's good, man. Uh, what did you send us, Jason? Uh, so it's an American Brown. All right. Um... Have you done this before? Time. First first time? Are you first time brown guy? Wait, so that's not right. Last time I brewed this was it's twenty maybe two or three three years ago for I sent it into the uh Oregon State Fair, I got second place overall in the uh brown and um amber super category that they put together. Oh, nice. Congrats, man. That sounds so, sounds like a big category. You're you're one of those uh, competitive homebrewing guys, eh? Um, yeah, not not quite as active in the. I live very rural, so it's extremely expensive to send stuff off to competitions, yeah. so not as much as some of those other guys. So yeah, we yeah. interviewed some of those guys that run that page, and it's a fun you know it's always a fun discussion on there. They were super nerdy and fun to talk to. I loved it. Yeah, so this is a little bit different than what I. This beer is a little bit different than what I sent into the. Uh, Sent into the state fair. I made some adjustments based off the judges' comments. Pretty much, never, never listen to judges. <laughs> well, they yeah, both well, said sure. it was. They both said it was too hoppy, so I figured I'd drop the hot profile some. And an American brown that's too hoppy. Yeah, I don't and know. in uh, Portland, Oregon. So yeah. <laughs> oh my god! So, someone from that part saying wow. it's too hoppy. It's got to be too hoppy. So oh my god, they probably imported someone from Washington to say that. I don't know why it's a slam on Washington. Um, okay, well, look, Brian Shar, why don't you start us off, dude, and uh, and, ah. and tell Jason um, your thoughts on his American Brown Ale, please. I certainly will. Uh, thanks, Jason, for sharing. You're welcome. And before oh. we get started, are you in a homebrew club? Uh, if you look at the uh, AHA website and check out homebrew clubs, I am, but I'm the only member in the homebrew club (laughs) did you start off as a one person club or did you drive everyone else out or what (laughs) um no i started off as a one person club trying to i've done a couple of like events to try to get people to join and stuff but i said like i live in a town of 800 people there the county Mm -hmm. i live in is about the size of northern ireland with a total population of seven thousand. Oh oh man what what state are you in are you in pennsylvania I'm in Oregon. Oregon? I see you have a Penn State shirt, so I, I guessed that. Now, yeah, yeah. Oregon has got to be challenging in some places, like you're saying, low population yeah. density, but there's also got to be like a lot of clubs in Oregon already. Uh, there's a, well, it depends. Like, if you go east of Hood River, there's nothing. Hmm. Right. Well, you, you just wanted I, to be able not, to. There's not nothing. There's you. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you wanted to be able something. to. Yeah, enter with a club name, as you know. So you've got an official club. You could enter as your club name, and you know, yep. maybe, maybe someday your your club will win the uh, you know 
Homebrew Club of the Year. You never That's know. That's right. All right, Brian Shar, why don't you go ahead and tell Jason <laughs> your thoughts? Okay. I so almost beard. had one of our 7,000 cats just knock over the American Brown uh, uh, there. So it was very fortunate. You, know, you probably just saw me. Anyone watching on video is probably like, what should the, ah, and like the sudden, that was actually, we only have four cats. And it's probably our <sighs> most sedate one just about knocked all my shit over and would have knocked it over right on my phone and my <laughs> laptop. So Damn, hey, awesome. uh, that's great. <laughs> but, all right. So uh, this is... Uh, American brown uh, turning to the aroma. It's sort of a medium chocolate, um, medium raisin. Uh, I got kind of a medium phenol that was both a sort of a smoky and and a plastic. Uh, low hop aroma. What I got was kind of a, a floral uh, floral aroma. The I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I think it might be in in the flavors. It's a little more pronounced in the flavor. Uh, six out of twelve for aroma. Appearance, uh, medium to dark brown in color. There, uh, uh, this is settled, but there was a large head, and it is, as you can tell, uh, there you go, uh, somewhat persistent, uh, clear with a, a slight haze. So three out of three for appearance. Uh, flavor, you know, at first the flavor I got was brown malt, uh, and I'll be curious if you used brown malt. You can tell us later on. Uh, I'm really sensitive to that because 10 plus years ago, I made a mild with brown malt essentially as a base malt. And mm. it came out extremely phenolic, extremely almost like a tire rubber character to it. And that's almost kind of overwhelming to me in, in this beer, in, in the flavor. Uh, it, it's sort of a smoky, you know, sort of a, a at least partly phenolic but really just kind of this, what to me is the flavor of brown malt is just almost overwhelming uh, to the exclusion of everything else. I, I don't really get any, any hop flavor. If I kind of strain, I can imagine there's some in mid palate. Uh, it's well attenuated uh, and kind of, kind of one dimensional with just that, that brown malt. So I, I gave that six out of 20 for flavor uh, body. Uh, body is medium, carbonation is medium, uh, not creamy uh, or warming. You know, I probably should give you a point back here because I get some astringency from kind of the, the phenol, but it really you, you're not supposed to double ding people for that. It's, uh, the phenol is a flavor and not a mouthfeel. So I'll, I'll give you a five for the, the mouthfeel. Uh, overall impression was five for a total of, uh, of 24. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing this. Uh, and this may just be a personal sensitivity to brown malt and experiences that I've had. But to me, it just tastes like, uh, you know, and I don't want to make an assumption, but what I, what I, what I would suspect is that you, you brewed this all grain, that you used a very high percentage of brown malt. And that's, that stuff to me just tends to throw a really high, amount of that rubber and somewhat phenolic character uh, when it's used more than sparingly, kind of like, uh, like special B or something like that. It's a, it's a very strong and powerful malt. And I, I feel like maybe it just got, got overused here. There's nothing that you've done that I think is bad from a, a technical or process standpoint. You know, I'm not getting, uh, you know, the only off flavors that I'm getting are ones I associate with that malt. I'm not getting, uh, you know, at weird esters or, uh, you know, sourness or anything that would indicate to me a bad process. To me, I suspect this is simply a, uh, a recipe issue. And that's much, that's much easier to fix than a, than, than a process issue. But yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing. And I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to come across like I'm crapping all over your, your oh, beer no. here. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that was, that was my, my opinion. So, uh, thank you, Brian. Cooper? I will preface this by saying that I, I have not been traumatized, uh, nor have I had any life altering uh, aversions form <laughs> due to brown brewing brown a beer malt. with brown malt. I, I don't think I've ever used brown malt. So, just putting that out there to start. Um, uh, bottle had a nice hiss upon opening. Uh, we're judging as a 19C uh, 2015 guidelines. I, I suppose we should go to the, the 20. 20- 21 guidelines at some point soon. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, uh, nice hiss on opening, a good bottle fill, um, you know, clean bottle. I'm getting a pretty rich chocolatey aroma up front, also kind of a strong nuttiness to it. Um, there's some notes of dark caramel low. There's a, a kind of a low, somewhat resiny hop note in there, but it's, it's really far behind the malt, super uh, subdued. Um, there's not a lot of fruity esters jumping out here. They're pretty low. Um, there's some a little, a little bit of a uh, little bit of alcohol uh, noticeable in there. I didn't get any DMS or diacetyl. There were real big process faults there. Um, that seemed like a decent balance between the malt and hops, but the malt malt wins there. Color wise, it's a nice medium light brown, fairly clear. Uh, just a bit of haze detected. If you look at the the sizes, it's, it's a little bit light. It's almost, you know, it, 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 it's in the range though. It's definitely not out for color, but it's a little on this orangey brown kind of end of the spectrum, orangey light brown kind of. Um, has a well-formed tan colored head that, uh, you know, started kind of medium, mostly finer bubbles and it just it stuck around quite well. Um, good, good head retention. Flavor wise. So yeah, like, there's this, a dark chocolate aspect to it. I get, I get kind of what you're saying, Brian, like a, 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 a light phenolic kind of note there too. I just think that there's, yeah, there's some dark bread, some faint coffee. Um, what I got maybe as what you're getting is I, this medium high bitterness, like a, a, a rich kind of bitter edge from the malt that I, that I thought was poking out a little too strongly. Uh, gives it kind of a rough edge to it. Um, it does seem that, mostly... That's a fair characterization. And when you say that, that's that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's not at all inconsistent with how I was maybe not as, as colorfully describing that. Come on. Yeah. Man. It's, it's similar to a phenolic or an astringent kind of thing. Cause I did get some astringency when we get to mouthfeel. Um, but I think it's a malt derived to me. I'm fairly sensitive to phenolics. And if there's a big spicy or medicinal phenolic, I, I might not, I'm not getting the same level of, of any kind of rubbery or, or plasticky notes that you might've been getting but just that kind of harsh malt derived roughness. The hops themselves are low. The hop bitterness seems low. Uh, just a light resiny citrusy note in there. Uh, provides a little bit of balance to it. Uh, it's just, it's quite dry in the finish. It, it gives the impression of kind of a, a harsh, like baker's chocolate kind of thing. Like mm. not the kind of chocolate. I, I eat dark chocolate every day. <laughs> One square every morning, you know. <laughs> wow, damn, your, dude. for your... Good for your heart. Sure. But, uh, that's you know, that's it's... medicinal chocolate from the medicinal chocolate dispensary. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. The no, cross I is... have that with my coffee and it just works really nicely for me. It's my morning thing. Yeah. The cross is but, brown. Uh, yeah. Instead of green. Um, you know, otherwise the beer, it seems <laughs> that that should, that needed, that deserved more love than it, it Thanks, got. Man. It's my welcome to my life. Sure. I, I, I it's all right. Great. No, go ahead. You did great. Cooper. Keep going. You did great. The, um, I love you. The ales, you know, the fermentation profile seems fairly clean to me. Uh, there's a moderate smooth alcohol noted, but overall the, the flavor could be smoother. Um, and the mouthfeel, I get a, a drying, but not super astringent character. There's a little bit of astringency and it's just like this roughness from the malt. I'll attribute it to it's, it's probably the dominant aspect in the mouthfeel. The beer is not, not really creamy or smooth at all. It's just, it's also not, not too harsh or biting. It's just a bit, has a bit of an attack kind of, mm. and kind of medium body, medium CO2, but just being really dry in the finish. And then just, just biting with everything that's there. And that, that little attack on the mouthfeel too might be also like, it seems pretty well carbonated might be a little higher than medium. It might be medium high. Um, that's kind of pushing a lot of, you know, bite and uh, you know, the flavors kind of aren't playing well with, with that, that mouthfeel to me. So I guess I would kind of disagree with Brian. I think the, the mouthfeel is part of the problem here too. I wouldn't give it a five there, but that will, we'll get the gloves on later. Um, <laughs> Overall, the beer goes down fairly nicely and has a good number of the desired elements of an American brown ale. Um, <laughs> I feel a, a touch more aroma hop would give it better balance, uh, along with a hint more sweetness to, to play off the rich chocolatey qualities that are there. Um, you know, nice job keeping the, the fermentation clean 
and uh, fairly well cared for there. Um, I would just work to reduce that st- slight astringency, you know, avoid um, over sparging or, or steeping into, you know, high pH, too hot, too, you know, uh, too low a gravity kind of a situation where you're going to extract harshness from the grains. Um, but, you know, I'd keep, keep brewing this. I, I landed at a, I'll give it an even 30. I, I, I think it's, that puts it into the, the very low end of very good, generally within the style per- parameters, but some minor flaws. I don't think the flaws are, are earth shattering to me that they're, they're, there's a little astringency. There might be a, that, the flavors that are, that are, that are going on are kind of detracting from it a little bit, the harshness, but other than that, it's not too bad. I just think, uh, and I, I, I do say too, that I, I tend to prefer a hoppier, uh, American brown ale. So I think those judges were, might've been off their rockers. I probably would have liked to taste the, the other one you brewed more than this one. Uh, so you no, know, I hope that seems fair, but, uh, thank yeah. you for sending it. And I appreciate that. All right, yeah. Jamil, Jason, Jason, Zana chef. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, I think. He's muted. Jams. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's right, man. Dog was barking, so I I muted myself. Uh, I will say one of the things that uh, the recent style guide changes, they moved the hoppy American Browns over to some special IPA category or something Hmm. on the basis that, well, commercial brewers aren't brewing the hoppy ones, so it should all be more, less, less hoppy. So maybe that's part of the reasoning on the why they told you it should be less hoppy i'm uh, i'm with brian on this about uh you know american brown should be hoppier um, all like the janet's brown baby <laughs> yeah there you go um uh bottle inspection all looked good uh you know everything was i'd say perfect from from the uh, initial bottle inspection aroma uh, uh milk chocolate up front uh some roast coffee there was kind of an oak smoke uh, like a, like burnt burning Oak, uh, smoke character. Um, the esters were low. Um, the hop character was really low for me. And, you know, I, I expect at least, uh, you know, some, some notable, uh, uh, hop character in there, but again, they've, they've moved, um, uh, like Moostrol into American Brown, which Moostrol is, it's like brown with, IPA, yeah, Moostrel is uh, brewed with a uh, British yeast and um, has some fruity esters, and so I'm not sure why Moostrel is in American Brown now, and I'm not sure what they what they did there. Um, uh, so out of that, I give you uh, the uh, a five out of twelve. You know, it shouldn't be uh, quite so roasty in the aroma. Uh, it shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be any smoky notes in the aroma. You know, going to uh, Brian Shar's point about uh, phenols, um, the smoke is a is a phenol too. So I, uh, for me, I I got the phenols that he's talking about. Uh, appearance, uh, it was hazy. Um, the color was light, as uh, uh, Cooper saying. Um, it was uh, kind of a deep copper amber. Uh, should have been a little darker. Uh, had a a large head. Um, you know, uh, Cooper was talking about the carbonation as well, a uh, bit too much carbonation, perhaps. Uh, and, um, you know, good tan color bubbles, but um, they were mixed size. There were quite a few large fish eyes in there. And so one of the things you want to do when you are, you know, uh, before you before you package, you want to make sure that any fines have dropped out because that's going to give you the large fish eyes. Yeah, I bottled um, this straight off my unit tank. Yeah, so there you mm. go. Fish eyes. I'm going to use that. Interesting. One. Yeah. You, okay. Know. All right. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, that, that's a real good one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's from those those microscopic fine particles, um, or you know, unclean bottles or something like it. the the bottle looked perfect. So, it, like you're you're saying, Jason uh, is probably from uh, bottling off the the uh, unit tank. Uh, flavor wise, um, oh, so for appearance, I, I just gave it a one. Um, uh, flavor wise uh i again i i put down uh f- some phenolic uh notes uh smoky uh a slight medicinal um 
uh, let's see here, uh, firm bittering, uh, balanced towards the bitter, uh, a bit of caramel sweetness. Um, there was a uh, toast, uh, some burnt toast in there and, uh, a little bit of heat in the back end from the alcohol. I, uh, I got that, uh, as well as, uh, some lingering, uh, yeast lysis notes kind of there. It seemed a little, a little, a, a tiny bit meaty or doughy. Uh, it's the way in the background, but, uh, for me that, that comes across, that's one of the things I'm real sensitive to just because I'm always tasting for old beers and things. Um, mouthfeel I thought was, was really very creamy and, and, and luscious, uh, for, for that style of beer. Um, a lot of times you'll get American Browns and they're very, um, dry and biting and not a lot of mouthfeel to them. Uh, so it's nice to, to have that in there. Uh, there was a slight astringency in the finish. And I think it's, again, goes to what, uh, uh, Shara was talking about in the, uh, perhaps, uh, if there was brown malt in there or some, there's something in there that is, is causing that. I think it may just be, you know, a bit too much. I, I assumed it was a bit too much, uh, you know, like highly kilned malt, like a, like a roast, uh, roast barley or something that, that really was, uh, um, adding these notes to it. Uh, I will say that there's over the last 20 years or so, there's been different brown malts available. And so there's brown malts I've seen out there that were like something like 60 love a bond. And there's brown malts out there. They're like 10 love a bond. Um, and so depending on which one you use, you'll get a completely different flavor. Hmm. And like, uh, Char is saying, if you use too much of the, the wrong brown malt, it can be overwhelmingly as he describes. Um, if you use one of the lower level <laughs> of brown malt, <laughs> it adds this, you know, nutty, um, you know, uh, character to it. Uh, overall impression. Oh, okay. So, uh, let's see, uh, flavor. I give it a 10 mouthfeel. I give it a, a three. Um, the, uh, overall impression, I give it a six. Uh, I thought it's a decent American, uh, modern American Brown, uh, it could use a touch more hop character. Um, the, the clarity could be improved, um, uh, a bit more color and, uh, less of the roasty phenolics. And I, I came out with a 25. Shar and I tend to be within a point of each other <laughs> every time we judge. Yeah, we're, we're just that much in sync, Jamel. That's we right. <laughs> Finish yeah, each I, I other's sandwiches. The roasty, the roasty edge to it in the nose. I get that as we're going through it, too. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think overall, like, uh, I think uh, both Brian's were saying um, – that uh you know it's a well-made beer you know there's just a few little things that that would need to be to need to be tweaked um and i also realized we have a full house uh three jasons two brian's that's, that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that means right. we win that's right baby double down <laughs> all of us we, we all all of us win and the audience wins too that, well, always, always bet on true. dr homebrew that's right <laughs> uh jason you want to run us through your recipe real fast yeah, let me pull up beer smith real quick. Right. There's going to be no brown malt in here at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was thinking that when you were saying brown malt. <laughs> I made a bold call and I I'm prepared to be proven wrong. All right, so here we go. So we'll we'll start with the malt. Um we got 4% special B, uh 7.5% biscuit, 15% brown, the rest um Row. Well, that's where the raisin that I got came mm-hmm. from was that special, <laughs> special B. Yeah, well, yeah. and I think the brown a little bit too can have some of yeah. that. Yeah, that's a lot of brown. Yeah. And then and then a pound of dark brown sugar. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then for the hops, at 60 minutes, we got 25 IBU of EKGs. At 20 minutes, we got three and a half IBUs of EKGs. And then at 10 minutes, we got five and a half IBU of Chinook. And then rural flock, servomyces, and my house um, strain of what was originally WLP 005. 
I got to ask why the dark brown sugar? I mean, American brown, what is the, what is the ABV on this? Like six or something like that, maybe? Well, five, that's five? another problem I had. I think is why it's a little bit, it's a little bit drier and a little more stringent than it'd be. I had a little mm-hmm. problem with the fermentation. Okay. It got down to, it got down to 52 degrees. Oh, geez. Um, it, it wasn't as warm outside as I thought it would. And it turns out the neoprene jacket on my, uh, Unit tank doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> Damn. What a way to find out. <laughs> but, uh, cause I think you could be getting those flavors from the malt. I don't think you need the sugar in it, but maybe you have yeah, some. The, well, the sugar goes back to when I used to bottle and not keg. I used to bottle with the brown sugar to give it a little more flavor. Oh, that's cool. That's a nice little. Zhuzh. It is really uh, dry though. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. finished. It <laughs> over attenuated quite a bit. It's, this is only supposed to be like a five eight beer, and it finished at like seven two. Oh my god! Wow, yeah, yeah it's a little, the same. A little, little hot for yeah. So how yeah. did you get it after it got so cold? Was it done fermenting at that point, or did you have the no, kick started even, again somehow? It didn't or? even start. It took it took about nine days for it to start. I had to bring it inside oh. and put it in front of the heater. Oh, that's so oh, scary when dang, that happens. Dude. Yeah, that's ruthless. Problem child. Well, I'm gl- uh, to be honest with you, Jason, if I were you, I would be thankful that it didn't turn out very good because then you'd have to do that same shit all the time. <laughs> It'd be your house process. Yeah, at that point. Not, not very yeah, good, but be... you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Uh, Jamil, oh, uh, yeah. What do you think I'd about say, it? I'd say this. Yeah. Uh, to to uh, your point, JP, yeah. is that um, it may not be the beer you dreamed of, but... Right. It's better than the, the a lot of uh, uh, homebrewed American brown ales out there. Well, yeah, so, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, take, yeah. Take, take take that to heart. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of his recipe, Jamil? I mean, fifteen percent brown malt—that's a lot of malt. It's a lot of brown. Yeah, malt. I, I, you know, for for brown ale for me, I, I'd lean more on chocolate malt uh, and uh, pale chocolate. You know, yeah. And, oh, yeah. I love pale chocolate, chocolate or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting uh, listening to your guys' comments and Jason listening to the recipe and what happened. I'll be completely honest. When I first tasted it, I was like, I need to, I need to put this somewhere. I can't, I can't ingest it. It was so bitter. It was overwhelming. But it was like a bitterness that came on at the end. It, like it was like a whole beer, and then it was like an appendix of flavors. It was just at the end. There was just more flavor. But I think now what it is, as it's sort of warming up. I think what that is, is that it's that that hot alcohol expression sort of comes through at the end. It's and it turns into almost like a bitterness thing. And it was very. That's exactly shocking at the the very end. Yeah. At the very end. The the alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Because for the most part, the beer just sort of tastes watery, but then not watery, but less, um, less body than I would expect. But the the core flavors, I think you have like 60 percent flavor is is there but it's that that harshness at the end that comes through and i think it it, you know now hearing all these these uh the problems that you had sort of makes sense as to why the beer is the way it is yeah i got a lot of alcohol in it too it's like is this one of those like seven percent brown ales or something (laughs) unfortunately (laughs) yeah yeah, it's not it's not supposed to be yeah you know jason i I like your instinct about trying to you have some malt complexity to it i think that's a great idea and I think that as a home brewer, you know, it's easy to to add, you know, a couple of percent here and there. And I, I wouldn't totally get rid of the brown malt in the future or the special B, but I might dial them back to like a couple of percent each. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, Jamil, you always talk about like the sack approach for professional brewing. Mm-hmm. You need to have one sack of this or that. Right. But, you know, there's no, and as long as you have a reason to add like a per, couple of percent of this, couple of percent of that, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, just throwing in the kitchen sink just because you happen to have stuff available, that doesn't lead to good results. But if you have a reason that you want to have maybe a couple of percent of special B, a couple percent of brown malt, some very kind of strong, flavorful malts, you've got a reason for that in, in this beer. This is supposed to have a lot of malt complexity to it. And I think having those malts in there is good just not in the degree that you 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 use them right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would probably see your English malt maybe less percentage than your special B. Yeah, I don't know. 
I would put um, at least a, a, a few percentage points of pale chocolate in there. Maybe some crystal malt. I don't know, guys. What do you think? Like yeah. like a C15 and 40, like a blend? Yeah, bring in some of those middle sweet kind of things to, yeah. to play off the, and, yeah. the and darker stuff that's there. Yeah, and yeah I, don't I would want back to re- off the biscuit for sure. Back that down. Back that down. And I don't want to rewrite yeah. your recipe, Jason, because if, you know, uh, uh, overall, if you like the beer and you want to make the recipe, then that's what we're here to help help you out with. But yeah. I feel like you could you could adjust it a little bit. And uh, maybe not leave the door open for some of those harsh, those harsher notes to come through. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I definitely need to go down on the brown model a little, and I need to not have it over attenuated. That little problem with my mill too. I had an old, no oh, man, three that's been since retired in favor of a Blitzman mill. But there you go. Like it was a, uh, it was pretty bad. As it, as I was doing my grind too, the the gap on the mill was slipping up and down. Oh, geez. Okay. So you were just everywhere. Yeah. That sucks. It's a problem brew day, man. That's that, I, yeah. uh, that sucks, but you it stuck was, it out. It came out pretty well for having the, for having the problems you said you had. Right. Right. I think this came out pretty, pretty nicely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would have thrown it out the window by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's alcohol abuse, man. Yeah. That's uh, true. Yeah. That's what you we get it before. You know what you're doing and, and, and you can see, you, you know, when you, <laughs> When you goofed up here and there, yeah. so you can you can do better the next time. And and I know you, I know you brewed a lot better beers than this. So, yeah. uh, Jason, do you have any questions for the guys? Anything um, you want us to address real fast? Uh, Why are you all no. so mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why don't you know anything about beer? <laughs> yeah, you should have given me. I should have had a sixty-seven on this beer. Yeah. yeah. How does you, my you ended up on, on the asshole's homebrew, not the doctor's homebrew. <laughs> I, I don't know. No, it's all good. Okay. Constructive criticism. Cool. Um, I, yeah. I do agree. I need to go back to maybe the hoppier version of it, or at least a little bit hoppier version of it. Than, a little bit, yeah. In this version. Yeah. Or the less problematic brew day version of that's it. That's also yeah. true, yeah. yeah. That too. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's only just going to exacerbate any issues, but... Uh, yeah. Brew it again and send it in, man. I know it. You know you. You said it's a. Uh, you're way out in the sticks, and so it's hard to ship beer. But uh, if you ever get, uh, if you ever get it down here, we'd love to try it again. Well, and I'd also say, you know, if you get feedback from a from a set of judges, don't don't necessarily make any changes on that, unless unless you know you had this, this really everybody gave you a terribly low score and. They were all hammering about, you know, in every comment they had about, you know, it being way too hobby. Yeah, maybe. But, you know, I enter it a few times, give, get, get a few sets of data back and then make your adjustments. Because mm. like uh, Brian was saying, uh, you know, judges are idiots and you don't need to listen to them. Because <laughs> they don't know what you're talking about. I will say, yeah, the beer is drinkable and it's dry as it warms up too. You get a little yeah, yeah. more sweetness out of it. It's not, yeah. you know, completely. Yeah, it's not dry. like if I was at your house, I wouldn't drink the beer if you poured it for me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be showing up to your house every day asking for more. Right. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in there, there's a compliment, Jason. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, I just wouldn't listen to, you know, you're talking about, going back to the hoppier version, I, you know, I'd, I'd wait and see, you know, our brew, the one that you're, you love the best, enter it in the category it fits best. And then, you know, uh, you know, after, after you get several sets of sheets from people, then you can start to see a trend and maybe that's where you tweak it. Yeah. Agreed. All right, Jason. Well, if that's it, we'll let you go. All right, cool. Okay. Cool. Actually, before we let you go, Jason, yeah. do you have a, uh, to, to plug your club in case anyone happens to be in East Oregon uh, interested in maybe joining your club. Do you have a website or email or some contact information for that? Um, yeah. If you go on the AHA's website where they got all the clubs listed, if you search for um, Canyon city, Oregon is the, the uh, city I'm in. Canyon city, city Oregon. Only, the only awesome, club man. there. <laughs> yep. Canyon city. Yeah. Well, well, good um, luck. You're going to grow. The, yep, and if you, if you ever make it down our way, uh, you know, let us know when you, maybe, that's right. Jason, you were about to say the name years. of your club, but yeah. we stepped on you. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, it's the Eastern Oregon society for the advancement of the Zymergetic arts. No oh, shit. What's the acronym? <laughs> 
I don't know. I have to come up with one. Oh, okay. Yoshi. Because most yes. people have yeah. most time yeah. when you when you yeah. have a club with a long name, there's a, there's a, a, a slightly humorous uh, you know slant to the acronym. But yeah, you need to work on the acronym now. I don't know. I'm an engineer. <laughs> okay. See, now that makes total sense. Now, you, now, don't do anything with it. Keep it. Keep it long like that. <laughs> Brew this one again, and yeah. Uh, yeah, send it back to us when you've repaired it, please. Yeah. Love to taste it again. All right, Jason. We'll let you go, man. Yep. Thanks, dude. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, man. Later. All right, we're gonna take a, a quick break. One last break. We're gonna wrap it up here on Doctor Homebrew. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for sticking around, everyone. We have done it. We have drank in some non-alcoholic beers. We drank some alcoholic beers, some very alcoholic beers. Some beer, actually, that was too alcoholic for what it was supposed to be in the first place. But that's okay. We're home brewers. We fuck up. <laughs> yeah, but... yeah. And if you fuck up your homebrew, please contact Brian at thebrewingnetwork.com and send it in to us. We'll put it on the table. We'll give it a fair shake, and we'll try to... Uh, help you remedy that situation. Yes. Or that, if you like have a beer that you're trying to dial in on the other side and you're, you keep getting 47s and you really just want to get to that 49, <laughs> send that one to us too, please. Yeah. We'll be sure to invite Jamil back for that one. That my help, help. My beer's you too mean, good. You Brian. Yes. Oh shit. Now you're Brian. Oh man. Now it's the council of Brian's. I feel left out. Yeah. If you're, mm-hmm. if you're too good of a homebrewer, let us know and we'll, we'll help you, you know, calm down a little bit on that if you want that beer. coveted 17 you've never gotten the 17 <laughs> we can teach you how to get down to seven maybe even get the 13 yeah the gentleman's you know, the 13. lowest courtesy score you're gonna get we yeah. can help you get there just let us know yeah jamil i wish we had more time man because i do want to talk to you about your your trip to england you went to england recently and uh but i suppose yeah. we'll have to yeah. wait for your next episode of brew strong for all those details that or you could have me back. Who knows? <laughs> hey, well, yeah, us on way, your man. show. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Brian, maybe Brian's been on it, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to come on there sometime. Hey, why not, man? You know? All right. We are going to get out of here, everybody. Thank you very much. If you are listening live, give us a couple of minutes. Uh, we have another show coming at you. We have a mead and something else. I don't even know what we have coming up here, but we have a couple of homebrewers to, uh, to, to cruise through. So thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you guys later.